We're going to look at John chapter 21 today, verses 1 through 19. And usually I'll show um, a clip from the movie, The Gospel of John, for this, but uh, we usually have some problems when we try to play the later parts of that DVD. So I thought I'd just uh, read it from the text here today. John 21, starting at verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we will go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Come bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. That's where we'll stop today. We're talking about how many of these major followers of Christ and of the Lord were not really qualified to be in those roles. Peter is one of those people. He's not really qualified to be an apostle. He was really a hothead. If you know through the rest of the stories of the Gospels here, he was the one who was who had tacked with the sword in Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. Just here, he's the one who, he's on the boat and they're about to head to shore, but he jumps off the boat. Just kind of a a, a rash sort of a person. He confessed Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of God, but then right after that, he told Jesus, oh, you're not going to get crucified. That's never going to happen to you. And then Jesus turns and rebukes him very sharply. He says, Get out of my sight, Satan. So, Peter, he was just kind of this volatile sort of a person and personality. And after Jesus was arrested, Peter disowned Jesus three times. Maybe you remember that story. You were with Jesus, weren't you? No, no, I don't know him. As a matter of fact, if you have the Bibles open, I'm going to read this passage to you because this is the backdrop of what this story is here. 
I'm going to read from Matthew 26, starting at verse 69. I'm just going to read this here because this is, this is what this story that we read today has in mind. Now, Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you are talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. So three times, Peter denies that he even knows who Jesus is, mostly to save his own skin. Now, this is a very serious thing. To deny that you ever knew Jesus at all, that's a big deal. There's some pretty scary words in the Bible and by Jesus himself that talk about this. Jesus has some scary words for people who disown him. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. No, no ifs, ands, or buts there. If you disown me, I will disown you. That's some pretty serious stuff. And before the Father in heaven. That's like on the last day when you're being judged. It says in 1 John, No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever acknowledges the Son has the Father also. This is very serious. When you deny that you know Jesus, this is a big deal. This is, one of, this is a cardinal sin, if you will. It's entirely possible that Peter thought he lost his place as an apostle after doing this. It said after that he had denied Jesus three times and then there was that rooster that crowed like Jesus said would happen. It says he went outside and he wept bitterly. He knew what happened. He knew what he had done. He had heard Jesus say these things. And yet, Jesus qualifies Peter to be his disciple and his lead apostle even. Jesus qualifies Peter. He was unqualified in himself, but Jesus qualifies him. He says in verse 15, Simon, son of John. And each time he addresses Peter, he starts with this, Simon, son of John. That's Peter's full legal name. This is not, you know, most of the time it just says Peter, maybe Simon Peter, or sometimes Cephas or something like that. This, that was his nickname. That's what he was known as. It means rock. So he was called that, and now, now he's being called by his legal name. In other words, I got something serious to say here. It's almost like Jesus is saying, raise your right hand. This is serious. I mean, if somebody uses your full name, that kind of gets your attention, doesn't it? I know that if somebody, was said, somebody said to me, Aaron John Breesman, I'd be like, yes, well, what's going on here? Uh-huh, this is what's happening. Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? What's Jesus asking here? Do you truly love me more than these? It, it's almost like he, Jesus was cut off there. It's like, more than these what? Like, is he, w w are you pointing to something here, Jesus, when you said more than these? Uh, what, what are you asking here? Well, there's at least three possibilities here. I want to throw these out at you. Do you love me more than these others love me? That's one possibility that Jesus is saying. So maybe he was pointing to the other disciples there and saying, hey, do you love me more than they love me? So maybe he's saying that. 
B, do you love me more than you love these others? In other words, do you love me more than you love your friends here? Am I the most important person in your life? Or do you have other people that, that you love more than me? Or C, do you love me more than these fishing tools? So your boats, your nets. Do you love me more than you love your job, your work, this life that you're living right now? What if I asked you to do something else? What if I asked you to be a fisher of men, as they say? So it could be all of these, and I would just submit to you that it's all of the above. Jesus is asking him, what, how much do you love me? Do you love me more than you love other people? Do you love me more than you love these, these things that you do? Jesus said, anyone who loves his father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus was speaking to Peter here, but he might as well be speaking to all of us because this is a call for all of us. Do you love me more than these? How much do you love Jesus? Is he really the most important person, thing in your life? Or do you have other things that kind of eclipse him? Do you love Jesus more than anything? Let's ask ourselves that. If, if Jesus looked at you, said your full legal name, and asked you, do you love me more than these? If you were answering honestly, how would you answer? The truth is, is that he loves you more than anything. And he demonstrated that when he died on the cross for you. So that instead of you perishing, you would have everlasting life with him. It's really kind of surprising when somebody asks you if you love Jesus. When, when I was examined by um, the Christian Reformed Classis, which was actually right right in that spot when I was examined, um, they, they ask you different pastors in the area, they ask you a bunch of different questions and see if, you know, are you, are you ready to serve a church? And my first question was, in your own words, what does it mean to be a Christian? And, okay, I answered that. And then my second question was, do you love the Lord Jesus? And I remember being a little caught by that, like, um, Yeah? I'm, I'm, I'm seeking to, to serve him here in, in his church, and I've gone through all of these classes and everything like that. I, I'm not doing this for fun, but maybe Peter was like that too. I've, I've followed you for three years. I, I wasn't just doing that for fun. I, I really love you. Jesus could have asked Peter just once, but he asked him three times. Same question. Peter disowned Jesus three times and now is asked if he loves Jesus three times. So, in this text here as we read it, is Peter going to reaffirm his love for Jesus three times? Just like he denied him three times. Now, maybe some of you know this, but in Greek here, there's a bunch of different words in Greek for love. And there's some alternating of words for love here between when Jesus asks and Peter responds. So I want you to put that up there. So we know, maybe you've heard the, the word agape. That's one word for love. And there's another word for love in Greek called philia. And that's where we get our word Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So this is how the line of questioning and answering goes. Jesus says, at first, do you agape me? Peter says, yes, I philia you. Then Jesus says again, do you agape me? Peter says, yes, I philia you. And then at 
in the third time, Jesus said, do you fully up me? Now, there's, there's some speculation as to you know, what this might mean. Most likely that these are just used as synonyms. The, the words are used interchangeably a lot throughout the New Testament, so they're not really limited to certain significance. But what I want to su- show you or suggest to you here is that that third time when Jesus switches his word, this is what, this is really twists the knife on Peter there when he asks him that third time. Because these first two times, it could be almost like Peter's dodging the question and answering him. But that third time when Jesus asks him, he's using Peter's word that he's already affirmed twice. Peter had already said, yes, I fill you twice. And now Jesus switches to that word. Do you fill me? This is what Peter had already been saying. He's not dodging the question anymore. Jesus is saying, do you really love me like you say you are? Peter was probably thinking, didn't you believe me the first two times? What, what is it that you're after here? And Jesus might be thinking, you denied me three times. We're not just going to pretend that didn't happen. We're going to deal with this right now. Because that was pretty serious. And I want to I wanna bring this up to you. So this third time, Peter is less confident and he appeals to Jesus' knowledge here. So in that third response of Peter, it's a little, he's taken aback now. He doesn't say, oh yes Lord, yeah I love you, at, like he did the first two times. This time he says, Lord, you know all things. Before he had said, you know that I love you. But that's something that we could even say to friends and family, couldn't it? You you know I love you. I mean, we know that we love each other. But this time, he says something that you could only really say to, to God. You know all things. You know that I love you. It's when our back's against the wall, like Peter is here, that you learn what it means to trust. Peter realized that he is, he's backed against the wall. What is Jesus after here? So he, he, doesn't, he doesn't really know how to respond here as much. He's saying, Lord, you know all things. He's relying on what Jesus himself knows. And that's true for us too. It's when we can't walk that the Lord carries us and we realize that He is carrying us. It's when we have nothing that we realize that Jesus is enough. And it's when we know nothing that Jesus' knowledge becomes everything to us. It's not what we know that counts. It's what the Lord already knows. And we need to learn to trust that. Look at the screen here. Let's answer this question together. No one in this life can obey the Ten Commandments perfectly. Why then does God want them preached so pointedly? First, so that the longer we live, the more we may come to know our sinfulness and the more eagerly look to Christ for forgiveness of sins and righteousness. Second, so that while praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit, we may never stop striving to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach our goal, perfection. So Peter, in this moment here, he knows his sinfulness. Jesus is confronting him with it. Do you love me? You denied me three times. Do you love me three times? And when his back's against the wall, he doesn't rely on himself anymore. He relies on who Jesus is. He knows everything. And Jesus has three responses for Peter. Feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. To love Jesus is to serve his people. 
if Jesus looked right at you and said, do you love me? His response will be to you, if you say, yes, I do, feed my sheep. Now, Peter is being given a special call here. He's kind of like the the head of the apostles. He's the one who Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church and so forth. So, So Peter is kind of being told this in a special way. But we're all told to feed my sheep. That's said to all of us too. Galatians 6.10 Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. There's some priority here among us. Us here in this room. Us fellow believers. There's priority there. We feed our own families before we feed strangers, don't we? We rescue our own children before we would rescue someone else's children. Fellow believers are our first priority. They're our family in Christ. And they are the Lord's sheep. So all of us are called to serve each other and to feed each other according to the gifts that God has given to us. So Peter's being told this in a particular way, but it goes for all of us too. And in verse 19, it says that, or Jesus says to Peter, that you are going to stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. That might not mean a whole lot to us, But back then, the words, stretch out your hands, that was an expression for crucifixion. When you're being nailed to a cross, you stretch out your hands for that. And they stretch your hands out to nail them to that cross. And there's a bunch of literature from the ancient world that uses that expression for people who are crucified. So Jesus is basically saying to Peter, you're going to be crucified. That would not be a welcome thing to hear, would it? Tradition says that Peter was crucified, and he was crucified even upside down. There's a picture of, or an artist's picture of that. All who undertake the office of feeding especially this kind of leadership in a church, must be prepared for death as they certainly have to do not only with sheep but also with wolves. When you're going to be feeding sheep, when you're going to be leading in any capacity, when you're going to be doing God's work, you're going to put yourself in danger of wolves that are out there. Jesus used that word to describe people who are against him. And that's what John Calvin said. If you are going to be taking this office of feeding sheep, which we are all called to do, you're going to be putting yourselves in danger of the wolves. And so this goes for all of us. To love Jesus is to give your life for Him. Jesus doesn't ask just for part of your life. He asks for all of it. And that might mean you might lose it for Him. Jesus did say, whoever loses his life for me will find it. Jesus laid down his life for us. He's telling here Peter to feed my sheep. You're an under-shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. You are the under-shepherd. Feed my sheep. And the good shepherd, he lays down his life for the sheep. If you're a hired hand and you see the wolf coming... You run away because you're just a hired hand. You're just in it for the money. These aren't your sheep. So when the wolf comes, you run away. But Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. And unlike a hired hand, I lay down my life for the sheep. These are my sheep. And so I'm going to give my life for them. You cannot serve well unless you're willing to give your life. And I would also submit to you that you cannot love someone 
unless you're willing to give your life for them. There's people that all of us love, aren't there? If there's not a situation where you could feasibly give your life to save somebody else, then I want to suggest to you that maybe you don't really love them. To love somebody means to give yourself for them. This is the love that Jesus has shown us. This is the love that we need to show one another. We know it, most importantly, through the people who are closest to us. To be a Christian, you must be ready to die with your Lord. This is what Jesus said to Peter. You're going to stretch out your hands and somebody's going to lead you where you do not want to go. There's a lot of us, and I've had conversations like this, I've wondered this myself. We, we wonder if we would have the guts to go through with it if it came to that point. If it actually came to the point where you had to deny Jesus or to give your life for Him, would we have that courage to, to say, do what you have to do, but I'm not going to deny Him? Would we have that courage? I came across this quote that kind of stuck with me. Some Christians haven't even attempted to think about whether or not they would die for Jesus because they haven't really been living for Him. So if you are living for Jesus, your life, not just part of your life, not just Sundays, but if you're living your life for Him, you would die for Him. If, it's, if He's in your heart, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week, throughout your day-to-day activities, if you're living for Him, then you would die for Him. And as intimidating as it might sound right now, you would find the strength to endure that moment. Because as the Bible says, it's the Lord who holds on to us. We in our weakness, we would let go. But the Lord holds on to us. So if it came to that point, and you were living for Him, He would hold on to you. And you would find strength that you never knew you had. In the case of Peter here, he was a, he was a coward. He denied Jesus three times. Just moments before, he had said, Lord, I'm ready to die with you. But when it came to that moment, he didn't. But Jesus takes a cowardly denier and makes him a courageous leader. And later in his life, he would die for Jesus. When Jesus enters your life, you live for him and you would even die for him. So this story of Peter is meant to be for the cowardly denier in each one of us. Regardless of what we know or what we've done, Christ can do his good work through us. And as we love the Lord, we will be blessed to serve alongside him even unto death. Just like Peter. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Our Lord God in heaven. Lord, you do amazing things, even through weak people like Peter. Lord, that means you can do amazing things through each one of us too. We pray that you would do your work through us so that your kingdom would come, that people would know you, grow closer to you, and experience your love and grace. Please use us, Lord, just like you used Peter, even if it means our entire lives and even our deaths, so that we would love you with all of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.